Hello, and welcome to my first District Dialogue of 2017. I'm Mike Mulcair, Douglas County's Commissioner for the County's 3rd District. Douglas County citizens in the past general election passed a referendum for the county to begin collecting, in April, an extra penny through a special local option sales tax. A SPLOSS is an excellent and fair way to fund large ticket items that in some cases would be almost impossible to fund through a general fund budget. A ladder truck for the fire department can be a million dollars, and the much needed public safety radio system may run as high as $16 million. It's important that Douglas County citizens not bear these costs alone. I don't know if you've ever looked, but the last time I drove through the mall parking lot, nearly half the license tags were from outside the county. The SPLOST proceeds that these visitors generate help you and me pay for the infrastructure and services they too use. Upgraded intersections, a state-of-the-art radio system, and ambulances are a few of the things that benefit visitors that they will help to pay for. The proposed SPLOST will last for six years. The projected revenues will be approximately $130 to $160 million, from which the cities will receive a portion. Douglas County's part will be approximately $96 to $115 million. Please join us. Well, gentlemen, these are exciting times in Douglas County. 2017 passed the Splawston referendum in, uh, in November, and we have got a great list of uh, compiled by our citizens uh, committee on things we want to move Douglas County forward on. Um, I think probably first and foremost, and, and, and certainly in terms of uh, where the funding will go, would be the Department of Transportation. Uh, Randy, what particularly excites you about the upcoming SPLOSS program? Well, it's certainly, as you said, a very exciting time for Douglas County, and we have a situation in the county uh, where we're having a real problem trying to get behind uh, our pavement management program and get get the uh, pavement management cycle down to a more manageable scale. One of the things we're, that we're talking about time frame between paving and time frame yeah. between the paving cycles okay. of, of each arterial and local mm -hmm. road uh, as it becomes uh, deteriorated and, and needs that attention. And <clears throat> one thing that's really exciting about this program is it's going to give us an opportunity to surge ahead with the additional resurfacing that we'll be able to do on an annual basis uh, because right now uh, our our resurfacing curve takes us out about 20 to 25 years it's to be too, able to get back. It's too long, isn't it? It's too long yeah. and if we're able to uh, get this surge put in place it'll shorten that cycle some and and save the county money in the long run because the longer we have to let these roads go the worse condition the roads uh, become and then the more money it will take to get them back up to a, an acceptable kind standard. Of, kind of, Chief Spencer, I think uh, one of the items that had the most popular support, you know, as I spoke to people in the community, was upgrading our radio system for public safety. And uh, would you kind of cover that and what that's going to do for us? Absolutely. We, we are, are just thrilled the, that we'll be getting an 800 megahertz radio system. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we're, we're very thankful to the citizens for supporting this. Uh, something that has been needed for a while. Uh, as you know, the city of Douglasville went 800 several years ago, uh, and now we're going to be able to integrate with uh, hopefully that system and several of the systems around us, uh, and we'll have true interoperability, uh, which means we'll be able to communicate with our other public. I was going to ask agencies. you what that meant. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. Uh, so uh, that's going to be a great thing for us. Uh, Currently, right now, if we need to talk to the deputies, uh, we have to basically go back through 911 mm -hmm. or change channels on our radios. Uh, all this will be seamless once once we get this new system. Great. Well, that's uh, I, I think everybody's very excited, very excited about that. Uh, it, it is a big ticket item, and, and yes, in sir. fact, I guess it's probably singularly it's it's the uh, the biggest ticket item. And uh, I'm going to talk talk to Mark now. That something like that, we want to get get on the ground, get it rolling uh, pretty quick. Is that something that we're going to borrow money against? How would that work, Mark? I, in my opinion, yes, I think we will. That's the I think that's the major project on the entire splice. 
We've actually already sent RFQs out for a consultant to one, design the system, and two, they would see it all, all the way through implementation. So we didn't wait. We didn't wait on April 1st. There's some lag time before any money changes hands, but we wanted to get that started as quickly as possible. So based kind of in a nutshell, uh, we, we determine what we need and, and what it's going to cost. Uh, and then we can start construction by, by issuing bonds to be able to pay up front for it. Yes, sir. And then pay the bonds back th over a period of time through SPOS, SPOS collections. Is that pretty, pretty accurate? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gary Dukes, Parks and Recreation, <coughs> one, of, one, yes, of my, one of my favorite areas of, of, of interest. Uh, what are your feelings about the SPLOS and what do, you, what do you see happening in the county? Well, it's a great opportunity for the citizens of uh, Douglas County to enhance their quality of life. Um, we've always had the outdoor recreation facilities, our parks and uh, our ball field, but uh, the SPOS gives us an opportunity to come in and build a big multi-purpose recreation center uh, that will be utilized by adults as well as the youth of the county, a uh, place we can run our own programming. Uh, we've had Deer Lake for a number of years, but uh, it limits what we can do mm -hmm. at Deer Lake. Mm -hmm. So a 25,000 uh, square foot facility will enhance all the programs we can deliver to the citizens of the right. county. And we don't have a location set for that yet, do we? We still, do not. We do we're, not. we're still surveying, uh, if you will. Right, the, the best best possible location. Um, going back to transportation, uh, th this is going to be a, uh, a significant infusion of money, as you say, kind of gets back, get us on a, a tighter uh, cycle as far as maintaining our local roads. But what is the? Uh, how does that play into uh, external funds such as coming from the state and, and the monies that they pr pay provide? What, what's the implication there between state and, and our SPLOST? Well, the expansion projects that are included in the program are very important too, and I, I, I want to recognize those and point out that there's a number of intersection and operational improvements as well as sidewalk and pedestrian improvements that, improvements that are a part of the program. Now, Randy, what's an example of operational? Well, an operational project? improvement might be uh, the addition of turn lanes at okay. intersections, okay. Uh, perhaps signal upgrade improvements, or the addition of traffic signals where uh, we have a need for those or we're close to having a need for those okay. today and we've just not been able to move on that because of economic issues mm -hmm. associated with the cost mm -hmm. of doing so. Okay, I kind of interrupt, interrupted you. So you were, you were talking about the interaction between state and, and local funds. So there are a number of projects that are included in the SPLOS program where county routes intersect uh, state routes. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to work with the state of Georgia where those, uh, those intersections exist uh, and either get permits or perhaps work together to develop joint, uh, joint projects that uh, would also perhaps include uh, some state funding. We've had conversations with the State uh, Department of Transportation about most of these intersections. They're aware of most of them but now we need to sit down and have specific uh, discussions about joint funding opportunities uh, or, and whether or not uh, they would participate in some of those projects. So kind of stretch our money. Uh, Absolutely, could, could. extend and leverage our money that's been allocated for these improvements uh, to the fullest possible extent. Um, going to uh, our, our fire chief again, now we know that the county is growing and we know that we're going to need more equipment and an additional fire station. Um, let's talk about equipment needs, how, how, that, how that takes place and how expensive individual pieces of equipment are. Could you give some examples? Sure. Uh, f for a pumper, which is our, our basic fire unit uh, that, that pumps the water to the fires, mm -hmm. uh, the, the average cost of one of those is about $550,000. Uh, we expect to get uh, 15 years out of that. So, when when you you know spread that out over 15 years, uh, it's still a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, on our ambulances, uh, we budgeted around 225 thousand each. Uh, uh, now this includes the equipment for them as well. So mm -hmm. so so that's good. Uh, but some of our uh, we're getting 
uh, as you said, busier and busier each year. We ran almost 17,000 calls last year wow. in Douglas County. And uh, I know one of our newer ambulances uh, this year that we, or we, that we purchased last year, uh, we've already got like almost 40,000 miles on it. Wow. So yeah. that, that, that kind of gives you a, an idea of, of how busy we are. And of course, you know, anything mechanical, uh, the older it gets, the more miles sure. it gets. And something that uh, I don't think a lot of people realize, uh, on our fire trucks, for, for example, uh, they may not have that many miles on them. Uh, you know, they may have, you know, 70, 80,000 miles. As far as the tires rolling. Right. Yeah. But when mm -hmm. they're sitting there pumping, that engine's still running and mm -hmm. uh, at high RPMs. So uh, really we should be, uh, and we do, uh, we go by the hours as well. Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th there's a need to replace them on a, on a fairly regular basis uh, and we've got, a, we've got a plan to do that. Uh, so, and again, uh, just being able to, to keep our equipment up to date uh, with new technology. Uh, What's a ladder truck cost? A ladder truck, uh, you can start at a million dollars. The, uh, and, and we've got uh, a couple of those scheduled to be replaced. Okay, and, and tactically, I think a lot of people misunderstand you need a ladder truck because you've got a, a 17 story apartment building and stuff like that. But a ladder truck is also used to reach more or less horizontally. Absolutely. Uh, to uh, put water on a fire, chemicals, or whatever. Absolutely. So uh, you could have a strong need, uh, especially with warehouses and that sort of thing, you'd have a strong lead, need for a ladder truck, and, and the building's only a story and a half or two stories high. You're exactly right. Uh, okay. the, the, the elevated stream gives us a huge advantage, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we use those quite often. So, mm -hmm. Gary, back to, back to parks. Uh, we've got a pretty good uh, uh, list of things that we need to accomplish. Would you kind of talk about the, uh, the park renovation part and some of the things that are going to, you know, going, going to be going on. You don't have to necessarily get park specific unless you want sure. to, but kind of talk about some of the things there. We've, uh, we've done a good job of building some new facilities in the county, the Boundary Waters, the Winston Park, the Lithia Park, but we still have some old athletic association facilities that are in dire need of upgrades. Some of those facilities are 30, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So part of the spliced money uh, was designated to come in, replace some old buildings, press boxes, concession stands, restroom type mm -hmm. uh, buildings, uh, replace fences where needed, uh, put new lighting in where the old lighting is uh, just uh, no longer effective. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, all those facilities, there's about five places that uh, needed upgrades and they will be uh, getting those upgrades through the splice. Mm -hmm. We heard from them. We heard from the association. Oh, absolutely. That's pretty strong, which is good. That's, 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 what, you want, uh, that's what you want to happen. Uh, Mark talked about these, these upgrades now, and uh, uh, are there ways that we can leverage county, uh, staffing county forces, uh, either sheriff's department or, or uh, county staff in particular, to kind of stretch our dollars by yes. using some, could you tell us a little bit about that? Where, where possible, um, we will provide the labor. Um, and I know that there's a lot of projects on there, so a lot of them are going to have to, we'll have to hire contractors. But if at all possible, we will use in-house labor or inmate crews, uh, especially inmate crews to do the demolition, which saves us money. Um, the sheriff department's really good working with us. I think we have uh, about 13 inmate crews and they work really well with us. Um, and then we also have uh, property maintenance division, which plus uh, Gary has his property maintenance division, which we can all work together and uh, do whatever we can in-house to help make those SPLOS funds go further. Yeah, you mentioned the, the inmate crews. Uh, you know, it's fortunate and unfortunate, uh, you know, that they're in that situation, but we've got some pretty skilled people that are, that are inmates uh, as far as uh, bricklayers or, or uh, um, plumbers and that sort of thing. So that's, that's where the, some of that uh, help can come from. It's actually pretty, uh, uh, pretty professional, if, if, you, if you'll say. Yes, sir. It yeah, is. So, um, on the uh, Randy on the transportation front, and I think probably one of the more obscure things that's in there, and at the same time one of the most significant things that's in there, 
is the focus, the correlation between transportation and the economic development. Uh, would you kind of expound a little bit on the uh, uh, economic development category of transportation and what, what that's going to potentially do for us? I'm not going to say sure. potentially, I'm going to say it will do it. Right. We, when we started to look at the, uh, the makeup of the program and determine, you know, where the emphasis area should be, we felt strongly that uh, there needed to be some transportation infrastructure in some economic development areas that uh, were lacking. And we all are aware of, uh, you know, the county's tax digest and, and how that uh, it's important to balance that burden between commercial and residential and other types of land use. Uh, one of those areas is the Thornton Road area uh, in and around uh, Interstate 20, uh, the south, basically the southwest quadrant of the inter interstate or the interchange there. Uh, we've had numerous uh, uh, development proposals submitted and a lot of that activity uh, had to be constrained or cut back or it was very deliberately uh, challenged because of the fact that we have a lack of infrastructure in that area. So uh, we felt it was important to look at including an economic development category uh, that would build infrastructure in these areas that uh, perhaps could uh, expand and grow more and increase the digest, but needed, uh, needed an opportunity to have the available infrastructure. So not only did we look at the Thornton Road area, but we looked at the area around State Route 92 uh, where the Lee Road extension uh, is, is planned uh, there have been studies previously done that indicated that the Lee Road extension was sort of the linchpin to creating uh, a market area and to create more opportunity for, uh, for economic development, for business, uh, for commercial. And we'll, we'll discuss that in some more detail, so sure. that's really huge. Yeah, and so we, we felt it was very important and we allocated a, 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 an amount uh, to that specific uh, category, but the board will make the final decision about how those infrastructure mm -hmm. dollars are spent. Great, great. Uh, Chief Spencer, uh, I've always been impressed with your uh, fire training center, es especially since I went in the burn room. Yes, sir. And got barbecued because <laughs> I didn't have a long sleeve shirt on. I had, I had the, uh, what's kind of, what was the gear you call it? Uh, our, our turnout gear. Turnout gear. I had all the turnout gear on, but I had a short sleeve t-shirt instead of a long sleeve t-shirt and I and I came out of there and I had red blisters all up and down my arm and chief didn't say a thing I, you know uh, <laughs> I, I was about ready to, to uh, cry uncle when, when the exercise was over but that was that was a great experience I want, I want to thank you for that but going back not, uh, going back to the training center uh, that, that's a great facility that Douglas County has and I know other counties come in and use it, but we're talking about doing some else at the training center. Would you tell us about that? Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, currently, uh, our classroom facility out there, uh, our, our two classroom trailers that we, we purchased from, or actually they were, they were donated by the school system. And uh, so, so that's our classroom facility out there now. What we uh, want to do uh, with, with this SPLOS money is actually build a legitimate classroom facility out there where we could uh, uh, train our folks in, in the proper classroom setting, uh, be able to, to train, you know, 50, 60 folks at a time. Uh, it would be a meeting place where uh, we can invite other departments in. Mm -hmm. We could have regional meetings. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's the main focus we're going to uh, use these SPLOST funds for at the training complex and do some repairs on our burn building. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that facility opened in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we've put a lot of fire in that building and uh, uh, we need to, to do some repairs out there as well. All right, very good. I, I know that in this SPLOST, one of the uh, big items for the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, not just in terms of money, but in terms of interest, was expanding our uh, senior center facility. Uh, and uh, of course we have the flight center which is, which is so well, well received. 
Uh, and I understand that's not directly under you now, Gary, but uh, you have a, a very good awareness and knowledge about the, the senior center and right. their operations. Mm -hmm. What are we looking at in terms of, of a new senior center, and do we have a location? Um, as far as location, it's been uh, suggested that it go out in the Lithia area. I'm not sure that's been nailed down completely. Uh, so. Uh, That'll be the decision of the commissioners where in the county that goes. I know one thing Mark did was uh, he did a map <clears throat> of the the present uh, client base, if you will, for the for the present senior center, the Woody, the Woody Fight Center, and uh, there's a lot of population out west Absolutely. too. Absolutely. So, so I think that's very much a, an open question, uh, especially since the, the fight center tends to be uh, fairly close to our eastern portion of the county. So from the map I saw, it seems like. Uh, a more centralized location uh, would accommodate hmm, a lot of seniors. Probably what would happen is your, your participation and membership at this center would go down because people have a, an option that's closer to them. That's correct. And, and then it will build up over time and then fight will return where it was before as, as our population grows. But uh, kind of getting in weeds a little bit. Um, what will this new center uh, look like? Will it be similar to the Woody Fight Center? It'll be about the same square footage, which will give uh, Woody Fight, as you know, uh, the membership there is into the thousands now, I believe. So yeah. uh, it will give uh, Woody Fight relief from the programs that it's uh, trying to uh, serve mm -hmm. the citizens. Um, this new center uh, would probably be, uh, I would say, uh, at least as big, maybe a little larger mm -hmm. than the Woody Fight Center. So it's going to give a lot of relief to Woody Fight. Yeah. I, you know, from my experience going to different, uh, we'll call them special events at, at the Woody Fight Center, uh, that place is full. Absolutely. And uh, seniors love to go there and dance and eat and run their programs and uh, socialize. That's a, yeah. that's a big part of their life. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, so I think that's, uh, that was another uh, big item on the SPLOST. I think they had a very popular, very popular support. Uh, Mark, uh, getting, kind of getting back to the money part, uh, what do we uh, expect to uh, bring in uh, county-wide? What would you kind of expect the, uh, the county's portion of that? Because we have to pay, the, the cities are getting some, some portion of the money that, that comes in. But, but what kind of your expectations? And I know it's, you gotta have to use your crystal ball because we don't know what the economy's gonna do. <clears throat> we have a wide range. Um, on that top end, we're expecting county-wide to receive approximately 160 million over six years. On the low end, around 130, 132 million. Um, as far as the exact percentages, um, these are pretty close. I think we get about 70, 71 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, the, meaning the county. Meaning Douglas County, yeah, unincorporated uh -huh. Douglas County. Mm -hmm. um, city of Villarica, I think, is about uh, four and a half percent, and then Douglasville would receive the rest of that, probably about about 25 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're doing the same range. thing. They're working up a priority list, if you will, of, of, of projects that they need to address with the SPLOST. Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, anything else you wanted to mention about, uh, about the SPLOST mechanism as far as the financials go? Well, we're on the low end and what we budgeted for as far as what, what's in the project list um, that was sort of developed by staff. Um, approved by the approved and recommended by the Citizen Project Selection Committee and then approved ultimately by the Board of Commissioners um, is based on the county receiving approximately a hundred million and that's based on the low end of and I say Douglas County receiving its portion that's on the low end of the 134 million mark for the entire county including okay. the cities okay and uh, well we'll see some graphics on the on the screen if we haven't already so uh, uh, Randy, I'd, I'd like to focus on the Lee Road. That's, that's another one of those things. That's in, it, it's in the print, and a lot of people don't uh, appreciate what the implications are. Uh, but tell us what the Lee Road extension is, is will be. Well, <clears throat> I think it's one of the most important projects that we've got on the book for 
uh, for shifting and changing mobility in the county over the next 10 to 15 years. We have a situation in Douglas County where uh, a lot of our north-south arterials carry most of the traffic that really wants to go east and west. Mm -hmm. So you're we, talking about Chapel Hill Road, Fairburn Road, yeah. Highway 5. That's correct. Yeah. We just don't have any good arterial base uh, in our network that allows traffic to move east and west uh, beyond um, you know, the freeway system for the largest part. Mm -hmm. So what the Lee Road Extension will give us and, and the Lee Road Corridor will give us with the new interchange uh, at Lee Road and I-20 will give us a good east-west alternative to allow traffic that wants to go east and let's face it, uh, you know, almost 70 percent of the workforce uh, in Douglas County works outside of the county in other parts of the region. So uh, the commute trip patterns are very heavy, you know, east in the morning, coming back to the west in the afternoon. So everybody's traveling these north-south routes to get to the, the freeway system to go east and west. Uh, to get better balance in the system, if we can get some of that traffic moving east to west locally on a local network. Keep it out of the Douglasville core. Correct. Mm -hmm. And keep, keep the short trips off the freeway system. A lot of people use the freeway system like a local system. They will uh, jump on at Fairburn Road and get off at Highway 5 or similarly, you know, with the Chapel Hill Road interchange. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we just have a lack of an arterial base, particularly for east-west flow and we see traffic migrating into other uh, areas that are really not suitable for the types of traffic that we're seeing during some of these peak traffic periods. Okay, specifically though, the, the Lee Road extension would, would uh, extend from its present terminus at Fairburn Road, mm -hmm. and where would it loop around to in your projection? Well, it would loop, oh, it would uh, extend over to Bomar Road with continuity being along the east, the, the uh, Lee Road extension to Bomar Road. So when you, when you put that missing link in, what that gets for us is it gets continuity from the new interchange at Lee Road all the way over to Bomar Road, but then Bomar in its present alignment will carry you all the way over to Highway 5 and then all the way across, or Bomar Central Church Road yeah. will carry you all the way over to Highway 5 and then across Highway 5 to Bright Star. Mm -hmm. so in the bigger picture, the cosmic scheme of things in the future. We like cosmic. Yeah. <laughs> if, we look at, uh, if we look at what's been done and studied with the poten potential for an alternative uh, uh, interchange at Bright Star Road, then you start to see uh, a relationship between traffic that's coming out of Paulding County and that wants to move into commercial areas uh, here in Douglas County that they have an alternative to, to come through the county uh, and we get that good cross-county mobility that we don't have right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, very exciting, very exciting times uh, in, in terms of economic development and what, and what this extension will do for us. Uh, Chief Spencer? Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, need, uh, projected need, I think in reality it's, it's a fact uh, that we need a new fire station and uh, what, do, what does your uh, knowledge tell you about the requirement, for, or not a requirement, but location and need for a new fire station in, well, in, in the future? Well, we've actually looked uh, at one of our, our big holes in our coverage uh, is down off Thornton Road around the Douglas Hill area. Mm. Uh, we have already purchased land there. Uh, so, so the land's already paid for. We've done uh, some preliminary architecture work. So. We're, we're very close to uh, getting ready to, to build when, whenever we're given the green light to start doing that. So. Okay, so it's uh, basically you're talking about enhanced uh, southeast uh, Douglas County coverage. Yes, sir. Coverage. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> Mark, let's kind of talk about s sequencing a, a little bit. Uh, but some of these projects, the Chief alluded to the fact that they're, you know, they're doing some preliminary planning and, and uh, renderings and that, and that sort of thing. Uh, but there are th things that can take place 
prior to money coming in and then conceivably paying ourselves back? How would that work? Yes, sir. You just give <coughs> it, maybe give an example. Well, a couple of things we, we've already started, which uh, alludes to about $26 million worth of projects. Some of them, I mean, most of them are not costing us anything right now, and some of them won't for about a year. For instance, the Chief's already developing specs for the um, year for 2017 uh, scheduled purchases for uh, engines, ambulances, and staff vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, we've started, uh, there's a uh, bid out for a traffic signal at uh, Riverside and Rock House Road. There's, uh, as far as transportation, we're working on uh, bids for Stuart Mill and Reynolds. Um, Randy, you might have to help me with a second one. One is uh, South Sweetwater Church and Doris Road mm -hmm. and the intersections on Chapel Hill from Soaring Drive to um, West Chapel, East right. Chapel Hill Road, West Chapel Hill Road. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was East, one more. What's the, what's the well, one? The big, it's the biggest one is, would be the 2017 resurfacing yep. program. 2017 resurfacing yeah. program. There's one more intersection though. John West Road. Yeah, John Bright West Road yeah. and Bright Star. And then as uh, far as Mr. Dukes um, in Parks and Recreation, um, we can go ahead and set the specs up for the lights at uh, the soccer fields at Boundary Waters. Okay. And we've got an RFQ out for a splice program manager. <coughs> that's uh and that's a good topic. That's RFQs we'll, co we'll cover in that in, in a minute because okay. that's 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 a very important facet of, mm -hmm. the, of this thing being able to manage this entire uh, SPLOS program with, with all the moving parts. And we've also already sent out the RFQ for the consultant to design the radio system for uh, the 800 megahertz. System. Okay, so there's some things that are moving <coughs> along, and we haven't even collected the first SPLOS penny. That's right. Uh, which will start when? April 1st. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, Gary, on the uh, parks and recreation front, um, the uh, enhancements that, that you all do in-house save the, the county, frankly, a lot of money. Right. Uh, I was out at the uh, Dog River property behind the uh, library where you all working on a, uh, an entrance and a, uh, I guess you call it trailhead. Trailhead. And uh, some pavilions and that sort of thing. Um, do you see, and we kind of alluded to it, but do you see uh, kind of an expanded uh, use for these for these crews around your park system using SPLOS money for materials and that sort of thing? We do. Um, we have a very talented uh, maintenance crew. We've got a, we've got a lot of people that uh, do carpentry work and are good with cement uh, and uh, just different skills that we can bring to the table. We we'll, we buy the uh, materials, the the uh, concrete, the uh, lumber, uh, anything. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, you saw the picnic pavilion being built mm -hmm. at uh, the trailhead at Dog River. I did. Uh, that, uh, if you went out and purchased that, it would have been about $35,000. And we're building the same picnic shelter for around 7000 mm -hmm. So uh, inmate crew, they're invaluable to us. They, uh, they uh, pick up, not only do the menial work, picking up trash and cleaning the parks, but we get skilled uh, labor from those crews and they are very helpful uh, in construction. Yeah. Um, Randy, uh, back on the transportation front, um, people are going to see some things in their community, uh, such as uh, turn lanes and sidewalks and, and, and then that sort of thing. Would you touch on that a little bit? I mean, you know, big intersections and, and ex, uh, extensions and stuff are very important to move a mass of people, but people tend to look closer to home too. Uh, especially if they don't leave the county. Uh, would you touch on some of the aspects of the SPLOS that will do that will be seen in the community? Well, as I said earlier, there's a number of uh, intersection projects. There are, uh, Mark referenced the project that we're trying to get uh, underway already, which is uh, an operational project to add some turn lanes on Chapel Hill Road between uh, Soaring Drive and uh, uh, into the uh, Eagle's Nest subdivision and uh, 
to over to East Chapel Hill Road, that seems to be a choke point. Oh, and Sterling Point. And Sterling Point, yeah. 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 That's a choke point along uh, Chapel Hill Road. And uh, we actually included that project in the, the failed TIA program years ago when, mm -hmm. when we had the, the regional uh, SPLOST. Uh, of course, that failed. That's all, uh, you know, behind us. But still a good project, and we felt it was important to bring it forward in this program. But we've got a number of those types of projects. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, Chapel Hill at 166. We have, a, we have a significant need for left turn lanes on 166 and mm -hmm. right turn lanes mm -hmm. on 166 and uh, dual approaches, a, an approach lane for left turning tra traffic and right turning traffic at mm -hmm. Chapel Hill and 166. Mm -hmm. And perhaps by the time we get the project designed, it may be ready for uh, traffic signal control. So uh, that's an important project that's in the program. Uh, there are numerous projects uh, throughout the county in each district uh, of, of similar type where we're adding turn lanes, looking at uh, choke points, uh, but I don't want to uh, underestimate and, and give uh, less attention to the fact that we've got some other projects that are associated with sidewalks around schools uh, and in uh, areas where uh, we have lacking connectivity for children to walk to school. In other words, we may have sidewalks in and near the school, uh, but then they don't go all the way out to some of the subdivisions. An example of that is um, is the, uh, what's the school, Mark? Uh, Chestnut Log? Chestnut Log. Log Middle mm -hmm. School. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th we're, we're trying to fill those types of needs with, with parts of this program as well. And then uh, we all know over the years what uh, uh, problems we've had with the Post Road Bridge uh, with its uh, structural issues and, and functional issues as well, lack of shoulders, that type of thing. So, uh, you know, it's important, uh, it's an important project and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, the Post Road Bridge is included in this program, the replacement of that bridge. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Chief Spencer, the, uh, uh, I was curious about what a, a firehouse is. Uh, is it, is it a, a kind of a citizen outreach uh, opportunity or tell us a little bit about that? Uh, our, our fire safety house? Yeah, fire safety. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, th that's a uh, basically a, a kid size house that, that we can take to schools. Uh, it's been up here at uh, September Saturdays. Uh, and what we, what we use it for is to teach uh, young children how to escape a fire, uh, what to look for in their house that could be a fire danger. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can fill it with non-toxic uh, smoke uh -huh. uh, so they actually get the uh, the actual feeling of being in a fire uh, we teach them how to stop drop and roll you know how to roll out of a bed uh, go to your nearest exit a place to meet uh, which is critical once you get outside of a, a burning mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. you never go back in uh, and, and we've had tremendous success uh, with that program uh, the the current uh, fire safety house we have uh, is 20 plus years old. Uh, I imagine there's a lot of upgrades in 20 years. So. It, it is. Uh, th this new house will actually uh, also have a severe weather uh, component in it. So uh, we can teach them, you know, make sure you go to an interior room with no, with no uh, windows mm -hmm. uh, in, in the event of a hurry, uh, tornado, uh, thunderstorms, stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, a, that's a needed thing uh, we need to replace and uh, again, you know, we're thankful that the citizens have, have supported this SPLOST. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, Randy, we've talked about uh, what in-house uh, staffing does uh, to improve our park system, but uh, we've got some in-house professionals that stretch the county dollars when it comes to road maintenance and road paving and, and that sort of thing. What, what, what's the mix in terms of the, what the SPLOST will allow us to do between what we contract out and what we have our uh, in-house forces do? Uh, would you kind of explain that a little bit? Sure. 
our plan uh, is to use our in-house forces uh, with all of the annual resurfacing programs that we have done historically over the last 10 years uh, through both combination of contracts and in-house uh, opportunities with our staff. We've resurfaced a lot of roads uh, with our staff over mm -hmm. the last three to five years. Sure have. Matter of fact, probably... A lot of people don't think so, but yeah, uh, we have. But, but probably 60% <laughs> of what we've done over the last uh, three to five years has been with our own, own staff, with our own equipment, and yeah. we simply uh, you know, are able to provide uh, you know, those scale economies that, that save the county money by using our own forces. And typically, they're not, we're not talking about main highways, arterials, but uh, what we're, are some of them? We're talking about more of the lesser traveled roadways that don't require uh, paving trains. And when I say a paving train, you know, all of the pilot vehicles and the follow vehicles and all of the various types of equipment. That the flaggers. Need, and the flaggers. We yeah. still use those, uh -huh. but it's not nearly as labor intensive. Uh, and, the in, and the risk. The risk is a lot less when you're away from those heavily traveled roads. But, so we assume that responsibility, which when you look at the network overall, it makes up about 70% of our network. Only about 30% of the network are the main arterials when you look at all the residential roads mm -hmm. and the local roads. So um, it really does get the county more bang for, for the buck. Plus, we've engaged uh, in doing a lot of the county's facilities, parking lots and, uh, you know, various types of... Uh, like the library. The library, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, animal shelter, mm -hmm. the new animal shelter. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing some of the, the parking lot resurfacing there. So, you know, we, we think that by having this capability, and there are very few counties in the much metropolitan Atlanta area that still do this, but by having this capability, we are able to save the county some money and stretch our dollars uh, and get more roads included in our programs each year. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the SPLOS portion of the resurfacing program because while we're continuing to do the, the normal resurfacing that we do every year on an annual basis, we're going to have another contractor out here working on primarily the arterials and collector roads and getting us ahead of the curve on those. Well, you mentioned one thing, the, uh, the equipment. That's crucial. You can have the uh, the staff knowledge, the expertise, and so forth, but if you don't have the actual heavy equipment that it takes to pave roads, uh, then uh, your capabilities are greatly reduced. And so we, we bought paving equipment. We're looking at replacing it and uh, uh, talking about a, uh, what do they call it, resurfacer? What's the thing? Uh, a milling. A milling, milling machine, machine. Yeah. And we're talking about acquiring one of those, which, mm -hmm. which will expand our capabilities. That's uh, correct. So as opposed to contracting that out. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, some, some great changes over the last several years in terms of road maintenance. Um, Mark, uh, the commission commissioners and the county staff didn't do this on their own coming up with the, with the SPLOS project list. Would you kind of give us a, uh, an oral history, if you will, about the, uh, the citizen uh, committee? Well, after about seven or eight public uh, meetings to let the public know about the SPLOST um, and get their input, plus uh, commissioner's town hall meetings, mm -hmm. um, we had uh, the first meeting of the Citizens Project Selection Committee. We probably had about almost 50 citizens show up. Um, they were self-voted, self-elected, so that group got together and put in place five members from each district, so a total of 20 members. Mm -hmm. um, they met with staff and our facilitator uh, six times, and they vetted the projects, came up with recommendations for the Board of Commissioners to approve, um, you know, a list, a project mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. and. I would say 95% of that list was approved by the Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. Actually, the whole list. Um, there were a couple of projects um, that were added late, uh, probably mid to late year last year, mm -hmm. and then, uh, but only one or two. And then, uh, as far as the sequencing, those changed a little bit based on uh, GDOT participation. Um, but essentially, everything they recommended was approved by the Board of Commissioners and they did a really good job. Yeah, 
Yeah, they certainly did. Uh, well, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I have great confidence in the uh, uh, execution of, the, of, of all these projects. Uh, but we just need one little additional component, and, and that's somebody that's really an expert on uh, managing a SPLOS, because we don't, you know, we don't do this, and, and when we do, we're focused on transportation or fire and ENS or parks and recreation. We need somebody that has the expertise to focus on the whole big picture, if you will, of, of managing a SPLOS. And so we're about to, pretty close to selecting somebody for that. Mark, would you talk a little bit about this SPLOS manager? Yeah, essentially this would be a full-time job, and this is somebody that would organize, schedule, uh, perform cash flow analysis to help us organize this SPLOS and keep it rolling. Um, meet legal requirements. Meet legal uh, requirements. Se sequence the financing. and Sequence the financing. They would also, they would report through me and through staff, and they would, they would periodically, um, we haven't set a date, I'm assuming monthly, they would make, uh, give reports to the Board of Commissioners and the public on what's going on with these projects. Now, you're talking about employ this uh, SPLOS manager. This would be a, a consultant, uh, outside consultant, who uh, in turn has his or her own staff. Yes, sir. To That's do, correct. To do a lot of these. Because even with the, 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 uh, the uh, SPLOS manager, it's frequently too big of a too big of a pie to uh, to carve up. You you got to have some help. So we're actually talking about a firm. Yes, sir. It'd be a firm. Okay, very good. Well, uh, again, I've you know speaking with uh, our department heads and, and and other staff members, but department heads that aren't here, uh, I've got the fullest confidence that this SPLOS program is going to be very successful. It's going to be very um, appreciated appreciated by our, by our citizens. And more so as, as the projects are rolled out and they, and they see their, their tax monies and our visitors' tax monies uh, go, go to good use in the county. So thank you very much for your leadership, and uh, the county appreciates it, too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Commissioner. Sir. Well, that was a lot to absorb. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me at 770-920-7266. Thanks to our Transportation Director, Randy Hulsey, our Fire Chief, Scott Spencer, our Parks and Recreation Director, Gary Dukes, and our County Administrator, Mark Teal. These county leaders will be instrumental in seeing our SPLOS dollars used effectively and efficiently. I would also like to thank the county's SPLOST Citizen Advisory Board for holding many community meetings throughout the county. For assessing the focus areas in terms of allocating specific percentage of funds and finally for identifying specific projects and their priority. Finally, I thank you, those who supported the SPLOST and those who will support the SPLOST through their purchases in the county. We will all soon begin to appreciate and enjoy the benefits of a county moving forward. I'm Mike Mulcair, 3rd District Commissioner, and I appreciate your tuning in to this edition of Douglas County's District Dialogue on DCTV 23.